Good morning. My name is Dr. Arun Nukneja. I am Dean of the School of Hospitality Administration, or Shah, at Boston University. On behalf of the faculty, staff, students of Shah, a warm welcome to everyone attending today to the first lecture in our distinguished speaker series of 2021. We have another five events bring us throughout the semester. So please save the date and time on your calendar for all of them. We would love to see you. In addition, we are also hosting our long-standing le annual leadership summit on March 26th. And an ode to our times that we are in, just like the event today, it will be virtual. Um, it will, uh, we'll kick that off with a uh, keynote address by Peter Greenberg, who is an Emmy-winning investigative reporter and producer from CBS News, followed by our Icon of the Industry Award, uh, presented to the legendary restaurant pioneer, Danny Meyer, founder and CEO of Union Square Hospitality Group. So please be sure to visit the PU School of Hospitality website to learn more and register. So before I introduce Ian, please know that we welcome your questions. Uh, feel free to uh, type them directly into the chat box. Professor Lance will be monitoring it and we will try our best to get to them if time allows at the end of the program. So today I'm excited to welcome the vice chair of our school's advisory board, hotelier extraordinaire and king of luxury consumer goods, Ian Carter. Ian has had an impressive career and I'm gonna just touch on some of the highlights. Um, he is currently the chairman of the Watches of Switzerland Group which is the world's leading retailer of luxury watch brands. Until December 20, uh, he was also the president of Hilton's global development and had many roles at Hilton. And we're gonna to come to those, but one of those was leading the global operations. He was also the CEO of Hilton International prior to its reacquisition by the company in 2006. Uh, before joining Hilton, he was the president of Black & Decker, essentially all operations outside the United States. Uh, before that, he spent a decade with GE Plastics, ultimately serving as the president of GE Specialty Chemical. He served on many different boards. Um, one is Burberry and the other one is Del Fresco Restaurant Group, among many others. He's also the president of Dame Maureen Thomas Foundation, a charitable trust, um, director of Visit California, Visit Florida, and many others. He's a graduate of the University of West London School of Business and Management and has received an honorary doctorate from the university as well. So please help me welcome Ian Carter. Good morning. Good morning. Pleased to be here. Fantastic. So we want to get to know you, Ian. So uh, we're going to start with, um, tell us something about you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? So uh, you wouldn't, uh, English people wouldn't be able to tell this from my accent, but I was actually born in the very north of England. Um, so kind of like, you know, the equivalent of probably uh, Philadelphia. Um, I was born there, but didn't live there for very long, educated more in the south of England, um, and then ultimately end up, ended up in university in, in, uh, in London. But all of my relatives were from the north, and they're very proud of it. Fantastic. Yeah, so your accent doesn't give it away. Um, when you were a kid, what did you think you were going to be when you grow up? Well, actually, this will be a shocker, Arun, because you and I have never talked about this, but I actually, at one point, felt I was going to be a farmer. I grew, you know, I went to, I went to school in the, in the middle of the country, which was very rural, and I had a couple of summer jobs working on a farm, which I really enjoyed, um, and it was a lot of fun. It was hard work, clearly, you know, probably too hard work when I look back at it. You know, it was, it was very strenuous physical work. Uh, but I enjoyed it so much that I actually thought about at that time going to agricultural school, which there are a couple of those in the UK that are kind of really technology driven nowadays. Uh, but in the end, I decided at the advice of my father that I should think more about maybe going to a business type school. And, and that's kind of where I ended up. But I've never really forgotten about the farming world. I did enjoy it. Fantastic. So two things in one, I think for everyone listening, listen to your dads okay because he gave you good advice Ian but yes I'm just now imagining um, Ian Carter wearing Burberry clothes uh, driving an Aston Martin wearing a Rolex 
and going to a farm to work on it. So that's fantastic. <laughs> so, um, so let's move to your college. Um, what did you study and what was your favorite class in college? So I was, I, I, at the time when I was at school uh, in London, they, they, there was a couple of schools in the country that did what was called a business degree. But it was a business degree where you had to be uh, sponsored by a company in order to attend. And therefore, it was a four-year degree. You did three, three full years of, of school and then a final year, which was mostly working at the company that sponsored you, where you wrote your seventh paper, a dissertation on a pre-agreed subject. And each of the, the months in the preceding three years that you were not at school, you were working for the sponsor company. Uh, so it was kind of a unique degree. It was a sponsored degree, effectively. And, and I, I did that in, in, at school in London. And I was sponsored by, at that time, British Steel Corporation, which was a, you know, the, the big, uh, like US Steel here in the US, it was the big, ma biggest manufacturer of steel products in the, in the UK. It subsequently, you know, changed dramatically in the subsequent years. But I'm forever grateful for them because they sponsored me not only through college, but also, you know, my early early career of business understanding was was very young because I was spending time working for them during the summer holidays when you know when other people necessarily were you know off doing other things we were, we were actually working so um, I'm, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question we have so many college kids here how were you as a student I'm sure you were at the top of the class and everything what was your favorite subject and how did you do so I could give you the, you know, the rosy answer, knowing that there's lots of people listening that probably would like to really know what happened. And, and I won't give you the rosy accent, uh, uh, answer. I'll tell you exactly what it was. I was pretty lazy. Um, I, I don't mean in the sense that I didn't um, do the work. I did the work, but I, you know, I was at college to have fun. Uh, I wanted to socialize. I wanted to play sport. Um, you know, I'd moved down to London and so, um, I think I got the balance about right, but it wasn't all academic work for me. Um, what it did mean, however, is in, for my finals, I, you know, I literally probably didn't sleep for four weeks because I had to catch up on a lot of stuff. And so I probably wouldn't recommend the route I took, um, but it, it, for me, it worked. I didn't get, you know, in, in, in the UK system, you, you have four categories of degrees. You can have a first class degree, a 2-1, which is an upper, upper second, a 2-2, a, a, two -two, a third, or an ordinary degree. I got a 2-1, which, which for us meant that you had a good amount of fun. You're not necessarily the brightest person in the class <laughs> and you didn't work too hard. So the 2-1 was always the goal for me. I'd never, get a, I'd never get a first. As the dean of a school, I think I'm kind of... Uh rethinking my strategy of asking you that, but um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure that it was the brilliance. I think it was, you know, you, you are obviously the smartest uh, person around. So um, for the listeners, I think uh, when you said, mentioned studying for four weeks for the final, I think uh, some may not understand that in the British system, there's only one final at the end of the year. So there's no, that's it. I mean, it's just, you know, yeah and regular exam this is one big exam so that's where people cram up okay so let's move on to your career i mean you've gone through so many sectors and in very senior leadership positions um some of the most well-known companies in in the world so what was about these companies that attracted you to them what did you hope to contribute and what did you take away from them that's a really good question Arun, because it changes over time um, I think would be my, my advice to, to those that are listening that, that you know, might be getting ready to embark on careers. For me, the, the one constant was that I, I wanted to work internationally. You know, that the, the, for me, the, from a very early age, I wanted to travel. And, and therefore, every decision I made, to some extent, had that in the, in the thinking. Uh, you know, beyond that, there was the usual things like, you know, can I, can I not only... Um, intellectually attach myself to a brand and a company, but can I emotionally attach myself to a brand or company? Again, because it, it, one constant theme for me has been that um, whilst you don't always have massive amounts of choice, 
the reality is, you know, you need, you need to have a great deal of satisfaction from the job you do because it's going to take up so much of your time. And if you don't, it becomes, you know, it becomes a, a draw on your energy. So for me, the first decision when I joined General Electric was um, at that time, it was the largest company in the world by market capitalization. It was $400 billion. Uh, it's a lot less now, but at that time, it was, it was the largest company in the world. It, was, it had many different brands in its, in its um, or divisions at the time, in its stable, including owning NBC television right through to you know, light bulbs and, and GE appliances, which are still sold in the US. But they were extremely international and very supportive of promoting people internationally should they demonstrate you know, the skills and should they have the desire to do it. So I joined GE not, not long out of school um, and I, only, I didn't work for GE in the UK. I moved immediately to the Netherlands and then from there to Belgium, France and then to America. And um, they supported and, and my career you know, with, with them. And, and at that time, it was all about learning quickly because GE was growing so fast that you were kind of promoted and then you'd see how you'd perform. So it was, it was a fairly stressful environment, but it, it really was great as related to those, those couple of things I wanted to achieve, which was one, become emotionally attached to the brand and, and two, move internationally. And then when I moved to Black & Decker, it was the same thing, except by that time I was you know, in, into my late 30s. Um, when I went to run the business out of the UK, but run everything outside of the US, including Asia, it was actually applying a lot of the knowledge I'd learned in, in GE. Um, and it was actually all about, the, in that particular instance, restructuring a supply chain and manufacturing, which doesn't sound very sexy, but it was actually what was needed to, in order for those brands to survive. They, they made no money at that time. And we needed to restructure the entire operations part of the company, as well as revamp the branding and the um, the, you know, the product capabilities in order for the company to survive. And, and we did that over, you know, over a five year period. And then, you know, joining Hilton, which wasn't an obvious step, but, but again, a, a kind of constant learning I've had through my career has been that people are as important as product in any situation. And, and it was the people I got to know over the years that I was in the UK um, working for Black and & Decker and, and joining the board of Burberry um, that helped me connect to the company um, Hilton at the time. And, and it, although it was a bit of a left field move, it was one that completely coincided with something I wanted to do, which was move into a service industry to try and understand whether I could be successful from manufacturing into service. And it coincided with Hilton um, wanting to um, have a CEO that was not from within the industry to bring different skill sets to the industry. And, and it, you know, it worked quite well because, you know, our timings coincided. And so when I joined Hilton, um, it was the best move I ever made. Um, you know, it was, it's a fabulous industry, a uh, fabulous company. Uh, a, a year or so after I joined, we took the, uh, I, I sold the company back to the US company and we rejoined the company as, as one after 50 years of being apart. And then a year later, we took the company private with Blackstone and five, six, six plus years later, we took the company public. That's about four or five years ago now. And uh, you know, during that entire period, we almost more than two and a half times grew the size of the company, um, entered many, many new countries, new markets. And, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time there with this incredible brand. Fantastic. That is quite a journey. I think I just have one uh, quick follow-up. When you mentioned that you moved from um, GE and you were late 20s, early 30s, you were already heading global operations for firms. How was that experience at that young age to be managing such far-flung operations? Yeah, I was, uh, when, I, when I became president of GE Specialty Chemicals. I was 33 or 34, I can't remember exactly, but it was, I, was, I was pretty young, as you say, yeah. And um, it was pretty nerve wracking, actually. I mean, you can't afford to show your nervousness, but I, a key learning for me at that time was, and this is, this is gonna sound obvious, but it is, it is it, it's been very important to me is, um, 
first of all, you're only ever going to be successful as successful as your team. So, you know, it really is the, the best advice I can give is make sure you spend time with your teams to make sure that they are getting everything they need and they can be successful because their success is your success and, and vice versa. So you can't do this stuff alone. Um, first thing. Second thing was, um, given I was pretty young and pretty, still pretty much growing, the next most important thing I learned was listen. Right? You don't really learn anything by talking. You learn an awful lot by listening. And so I was surrounded by people that were actually much more experienced by me. My direct team, my, you know, my, my direct reports, the senior leadership team were all more experienced than me, um, both subject matter and in terms of their experience of that of the particular company. So I learned a lot from them. Um, and, and then was able to effectively lead better because we could formulate plans we all agreed upon and executed upon. And we were frankly quite successful at doing that. You know, we, we, we took the company, and grew it and also made it more profitable. And then interestingly, those exact same skill sets worked even better at Hilton because I was by no means a subject matter expert at Hilton other than I was a customer, you know. So again, being surrounded by people that had 10, 20, 30 years in the industry, um, you know, learning from them, listening to them before jumping in and making decisions was a, probably the single most important thing I, I could have done. And that's, I, I think, you know, it may be different for other people, but it served me well. Wise words indeed. And I think uh, all leaders should be doing and practicing that. Um, so, you go into a company, you're much younger um, and you're listening and you're trying to learn the business, but at some point the company has hired you to make changes. And so you, at that point, get a lot of resistance and a lot of pushback from saying, I've been in this business 30 years, more than what you've been longer, you've been alive. So how did you tackle that? You know, that, that one, I think, again, it goes back to frankly, you know, understanding the way the people, the team ticks, right? Because ultimately what your question gets at is how, how do you ensure everybody stays on board with you to once you've, ex, you know, explained and agreed on a strategy? And some inevitably won't. Some, some people inevitably won't see it the same way as you and you have to make a decision. Can they, can they operate and still work within the strategy or in fact, you need to make some changes? They're always the tough decisions. But ultimately, as you say, you'll pay, you, you know, in this case, I was paid to, lead the business, not follow the business. So I think the key is you, 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 know, you really have to get everybody on board on the same page. And that applies in any business, whether it's the GM of the hotel or whether it's a GM of a business out in, you know, in any area, you, you need to have a team that supports the strategy and it become the rallying cry. And that can, you know, that my, my experience has been that that requires a disproportionate amount of time to ensure you get people on board but it's time that you need to invest, you know? And, and so often case, it can be ensuring that people feel and have genuinely input to the strategy. N not necessarily it's all adopted or adapted, but it have, they have input to it. But the key is that once you have it agreed, everybody feels as comfortable as you do executing it. And so I think that, that, you know, the key for me was after getting through the listening and understanding was making sure that I um, had everybody on board with the strategy that we defined, because ultimately it was going to be me that was leading it, but I needed everybody lined up behind it. And, and that's been critical actually in any role. I think at any level, actually. Fantastic. I think those are very, very good lessons for all of us. Um, Ian, I just want to go back to Hilton and the lodging industry for a minute, since a lot of people listening are in, in that industry. So what is your outlook, uh, given everything that has happened over the past one year and the troubles we've been in? What is your outlook for the future, medium term, long term? So look, that, that's, that's the million dollar question, right? But I, I would say with a high, very high degree of confidence, um, and you might expect me to say this, but I will say it anyway, that, that the lodging industry is still a fabulous place to be. It will, it will bounce back. Um, long term, I don't see any massive changes in trends. You know, the demographics um, of, of countries and the world are, are, are not going to change dramatically because of COVID. 
people are still getting older in, in the West and, and living longer and want to have disposable income they want to use to travel. I don't think those things change. I think there are some short term changes, you know, we, and we are demonstrating one of those right now. We've got you know, a couple of hundred people on a Zoom call, which, you know, in other circumstances, you know, or, or if this were a business, we might be meeting in person. I think those days are a bit further off. Um, because I think I think that will require time for people to think what what meetings do they want to have and conferences do they have in person versus they, they use other media medium. Um, but but long term, still a fabulous industry, still people will want to travel and still people will want to explore, be it on leisure or on business. I think in the medium term, there's a couple of interesting trends that we'll see. First of all, business travel will resume in a more comprehensive way than currently we're seeing you know people are still very restricted because although i think we all feel probably at least in the western world we can feel that there is a light towards the end of the trunk tunnel now with the vaccines being administered and you know that the rate of increase on the vaccinations is growing you know we we all feel that there's going to be some degree of return to normality whatever new normality is sometime during this year you know next year might be the full year when we start to see it impactors but i think business travel starts to return and and that will benefit the lodging industry you know enormously particularly in drive to markets as opposed to fly to markets they again will take a little bit longer as planes get layered back into the system etc and then meetings beyond that i think actually interestingly luxury travel will probably benefit sooner rather than later and you know we saw that 2008 9 10 after the financial crash luxury travel back came back pretty quickly um, and I think that will be the case here because by definition, luxury hotels, luxury travel tends to be smaller and more exclusive in, in, the, in the sense that the, the spaces are you know, large, but the number of people is small. And so I think that bounces back, you know, somewhat quicker. And fundamentally, despite the fact and, you know, that one of the tragedies, of course, of COVID is that, that many jobs have been lost in, in people to people businesses. There is still a high amount of, uh, of money circulating in the system generally. I'm just talking very generally now. Uh, whether it be money for investment you know, from, from banks and private equity houses, or it be disposable income for those people that have, you know, have, have kept their jobs and, and have, have been saving money because they haven't been doing stuff because they're nervous, and right, you know, rightly so. At some point, we get to, you know, to use a Malcolm Gladwell-ism, we get to a tipping point and that tipping point will be when people feel, hey, I think we, we, we feel better about traveling now. We feel better about spending money. We feel better about going to restaurants. And at that point, we start to see things pick up. And in the lodging industry, it will be I kind, kind of sequenced, as I, as I mentioned, I think, you know, from, from local business travel through to luxury leisure travel, through to general leisure travel, through to businesses and conferences being probably the last that we see. But I do see that long-term, this is still a fantastic industry. Thank you. With that optimistic note, I think uh, we're gonna move to uh, the luxury segment because we're getting a lot of questions and that has generated a lot of interest as well. So um, you've been part of the luxury sector for a long time with, with Burberry, with um, now of course the watches of Switzerland and um, th there is um, a few car dealerships in, in DC area that we can talk about, but what is it about luxury that attracts you? Sorry, it's, it's interesting Arun, I, I kind of fell into it rather than you know, marched into it with a, a, a big objective. Um, and again, it goes back to that constant theme of people that you know and connections that you make in life. Uh, uh, the chairman of Burberry at the time I joined the board, which was you know, 13, 14 years ago, um, had recognized strategically that one of the things that Burberry needed to do was, was relook its supply chain you know, it, to, in order to be conti continue to be successful. The China market was growing massively as it, as, as, as it has continued to do. Uh, and I'll give you one quick stat that, that's maybe interesting for people to hear is that luxury sector generally, you know, and this is everything from jewelry to apparel to small leather goods, large leather goods. If you took that whole market for luxury product in the fashion area and apparel area, roughly one third of all purchases are made by Chinese Asian consumers 
either in China or traveling outside of China. That's how important the China market became. So the chairman of Burberry at the time when I joined the board, uh, Sir John Peace, John was looking for someone with some expertise in understanding supply chain in China to join the board as a non-executive advisor. I had moved all of the operations of Black & Decker to China. I, you know, by the time I left, I had 10,000 people in our team working in Guangzhou. Um, and subsequently, of course, had to rebuild the supply chain. So I had that subject matter expertise. So I joined the board of Burberry to help the team on that basis. Subsequently, I fell in love with the brand and I fell in love with that segment and I got to learn an awful lot more. And that, so that's kind of what led me into that area. As a consequence, I then, you know, later down the line, I became chairman of a, uh, one of the high-end uh, white tablecloth um, restaurant companies in the US, Del Frisco's restaurant group. So, you know, we had four brands, uh, uh, the, the highest one being um, Del Frisco's Double Eagle, the largest restaurant grossing restaurant in New York um, is the Del Frisco's Double Eagle on Sixth Avenue. Um, and then three, three other brands, a grill, a Barcelona, which is a tapas brand, and um, a taco brand, all, all of which were the height of their segment that they operated in. So I got to understand that business as a consequence of both my experience at Burberry Luxury, and of course, by that time, I'd been at, at uh, Hilton for over 10 years. We took the company private, um, frankly, just in time. We took the company private in the end of 2018. Um, so the shareholders, I'm sure, were very happy, given everything that happened, unfortunately, afterwards. Um, but that took me into the luxury area. And of course, during that whole era, we, we at Hilton had decided that in order for us to be truly representative of all the customers that we serviced and serve, and our 100 million, do, uh, million people that were members of Hilton Honors, we needed to be strong in the luxury segment. So we revitalized, reinvented, reinvigorated the Waldorf Astoria brand the Conrad brand, and then our LXR collection. And that was quite a journey, but now, you know, as, as those, those that will take a look at the Hilton website, what you'd see is that, you know, we have, you know, over 50 Hil uh, Waldorf Astorias and, and Conrads around the world in great locations, fabulous hotels, great representations of luxury. So all of those things kind of came together for me over the last decade. And, and I spent time really understanding the luxury segment and, and the uniqueness of it. And I enjoyed it. I mean, you know, what's not to enjoy? I, I would stress, however, you know, that, that one of the most incredible brands, and I, again, you might say I'm bound to say this, but one of the most incredible brands that I've ever come across is the Hampton Inn brand. It is incredibly strong. It, it, you know, if you look at that from a consumer perspective, it has great customer scores. If you look at it from an owner perspective, it has great financial returns. So it's not that I'm just in love with luxury. I mean, luxury is fun, of course, uh, but I, I appreciate any good brand and, and the brand promise. And if it delivers on the brand promise, promise typically it's successful. And, and so, you know, it's just it so happens I've managed to spend a bit of time in luxury and enjoyed that as well. Fantastic. So I want to ask um, your current role as chairman of the of Switzerland. Um, everyone around me, that I know, that I meet, and I see wearing a smartwatch. So in this day and age, when smartwatches are the rage, who are these people buying luxury watches? And how is that business doing? Well, uh, it's doing great, first of all. I mean, despite the pandemic, uh, and I will caveat uh, any answers I give on this subject uh, on, uh, on the basis that I've only been chairman for three months. So I'm, I'm learning still, <laughs> I'm still in the learning phase. However, a couple of things I can tell you. First of all, I think luxury watches are entirely complementary to, um, you know, smart watches. They are not substitutive often. They are just simply complementary to, and, and we find many of our customers own both. They own luxury watches that which they use for a different occasion and they might use a smart watch for. I own a smart watch um, as well, for example. Um, so, you know, I think, I think it's, first of all, it's a market that has continued to grow consistently for, for many years. Um, and in part, again, driven by the Chinese consumer, which is common across all luxury, luxury segments. 
but also um, the, the changes that I can speak specifically to Walters of Switzerland that they, they have driven is that fundamentally they have they made a decision the watches switching group we made a decision that we wanted to make luxury uh, watches more accessible accessible not necessarily on price but there is a wide range of pricing from you know from omega and tag right the way through to patek philippe uh, but more in terms of the atmosphere created when you go into a store because i think much like in other areas of luxury uh, it's shopping in luxury can be intimidating and and that's you know, sometimes some brands want to create that intimidating feeling because they don't want stores, you know, um, overly full. But in other cases, it was actually precluding people from making decisions about, you know, jewelry or watches, which they're very capable and wanted to make, but just didn't feel comfortable going into a particular store. So I think Watches of Switzerland Group has been quite instrumental in changing that thinking, um, you know, through some of the brands that we own in terms of our stores in the UK and in the US. And I found that really interesting because they, 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 that's, that's a change in trend, which has actually grown the size of market. And, you know, even, even during the times of COVID, um, the, the overall performance that we have seen in our business has been re really, really good. I mean, it's been very strong. We announced our third quarter results uh, 10 days ago and, and, you know, I think surprised the market how well we had performed. But it's been a combination of e-commerce, as you might imagine, during these times and still the ability to, to have um, what we call click and collect. So you can buy a watch and then go and pick it up, um, but not go into the store. So the overall, I mean, the answer to your question is that I think, first of all, they're complementary, used for different purposes. And secondly, the market remains very strong. Fantastic. I think um, uh, this, this concept of um, just click and buy and then go pick it up sounds very familiar to me fast food restaurants where you just order food and go except that you're paying 30, 40 or a couple hundred thousand dollars. So um, very interesting. So I've got to ask you, uh, Ian, this one question came from one of the participants today and I actually had to Google to understand what this question was. Uh, apparently there is a legendary model of Patek Philip called Nautilus 5711, which used to be sold for about $35,000 in limited production. And people put their names on the waiting list and they were on the waiting list for eight, 10 years. And without much fanfare, the company just stopped production of that model. What's your take on this abrupt discontinuation? You know, it's actually, it's really interesting because Thierry Stern, who's the, the CEO of, of Patek Philippe, this is a Patek Philippe watch, obviously. Um, I think, I think, I haven't spoken to him about it, but I think his decision was based upon the fact that he wanted to continue to be exclusive within the segment that Patek Philippe um, serves, you know, within, within their customer base. And the 5711 had become somewhat ubiquitous and the demand far outstripped supply. So, you know, I think it's almost a demonstration of what true luxury is, you know, where it, it's entirely supply driven and, and demand is always outstripping um, uh, supply. Um, I know that there, he, he, uh, his decision was consciously made on the basis of uh, maintaining um, exclusivity, but also uh, investment, making an investment decision when you buy a Patek Philippe watch, because it's probably going to appreciate in value. And I think he's, he's assured the many followers that the, the replacement for the 5711 is going to be even better. And so, you know, he's kind of creating excitement about what comes next. Um, I think it's a great demonstration of what true luxury and exclusivity means. And you see it in other industries as well. I think, you know, if you think about the Birkin bag, you know, from Hermes, it's, it's, it's also very difficult to get hold of and increases in value. But you know, a bag is a bag in the sense if you if you compare, you know, a smart watch to a watch, they both tell the time. A luxury watch, but a Birkin bag is the same. You know, it, it's created this aura around it. It's in high demand. Supply uh, is less than demand. Therefore, it's always you know, a price. Uh, the prices typically go up, go up, and I think that's what Thierry was thinking when when he looked at the five seven eleven and maintained that exclusivity. But let's see what the replacement is. I'm sure it's going to be very, very exciting. 
Um, so I want to switch. Um, uh, we can talk about luxury. It's a lot of interest, but we need to uh, switch to, since we have a lot of young alumni and students in here. Uh, along the journey, the extensive journey that we have just chronicled, um, I'm sure you've had some mentors. Um, so what, who were your mentors or what did you learn from them? Yes, I have. Um, you know, in a way, it's kind of like too, too, too many to mention, because I think, again, if you, if you believe in what I said about listening and, and, and learning, you, you can take something from everyone. You know, don't necessarily use it all, but you can learn something, right? And you apply what makes sense to you. And I'm not saying it's 100% right, but, you know, you're going to get probably more right than wrong. Um, but along the way, I had, I would say, a, you know, a few fairly significant mentors who I had really good advice from. You know, one when I was at GE, a guy called Fernando Bacali, um, Italian, you know, really experienced business person. And he helped guide me into making decisions about where I moved internationally. Oddly, although I never worked directly for him, I would, my one over one boss at GE was Jack Welsh. And Jack at the time was, uh, and sadly he died, but he's, he's, he, at that time, he was a business icon in America. And so twice a year, I would have reviews with him. And there was not a minute I spent with him where I didn't learn something. And I was either, you know, shouted at or spoken to or given good advice from, but always in, an, you know, in a fun way because he was very different in person than people thought. Uh, but I learned an awful lot from him. The, the, the single most important thing I think I learned from him and at the time at GE, which actually transcended everywhere else everyone was, was this whole notion about investing in people. You know, GE was great at buying businesses, selling businesses, growing businesses, but the constant theme was developing people. You know, there's no point in going and buying a business if you've got no good people to go help run it. And, and, and that was the constant theme. So I think that was the biggest mentoring learning I had from everyone at GE was just invest time and, and energy in growing people. And that's what we did. I think when I joined, uh, you know, I joined Hilton in particular, there was, there was really two, two people that I've, I've learned a lot from and, and worked, you know, had a great time working with. Chris, obviously, Chris and Seta, Net, you know, most recently, Chris and I have been to, were together at the business for, you know, 15 years together because uh, we started almost at the same time you know, when we took the company private anyway. And prior to that, David Michels, who ran the Hilton Group in, when, when it was a separate company and, and, um, and um, was listed in the UK and I became CEO. And David was a, is kind of a legend in that business as well because David started is, as a busman in the, in the restaurant and then became CEO of the company, you know, 35 years later or something. And so I learned a heck of a lot from, from David, including humility. Um, what advice would you have for students, for students and young alumni that are watching and listening today? Well, look, I would say, and this is really tough, right? Because it's, it's a really odd time we're living through, but don't, don't become dis, 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 dischanted by what's happening right now. It's easy to say and difficult to do, but actually, you know, for those of you on the call, um, you wouldn't know this, but Arun and I and the, and the, the rest of the um, board have had a call last week or the week before. And one of the things we talked about was how we ensure that the students that are with us around the world stay engaged, stay feel connected, etc. And, and one of the things that we've been thinking about and has and Arun has enacted was, you know, giving some favorable conditions to be able to stay on and learn for an extra year. Those kinds of things. And I would say, look, right now we're in an unusual time. I do personally see a way out of all of this. I think the, the industry will return, the business will return. Uh, to some degree of normality and we'll start growing again and there will be plenty of jobs for people. Um, but I would use this time to learn, just, just to, to whatever it may be that you think you can do additionally that will help you a year from now, 18 months from now, you know, engage in that. Build your networks, make sure you stay in touch with people because it's difficult at this point to do that without, um, you know, without personal contact, but continue to build on your networks, personal networks, business networks. Um, and be prepared to be flexible. You know, I think one of the things, again, we, we at the, um, uh, at, uh, at, uh, on, Arun's, uh, on the board of Shah, we've been discussing is, you know, industries like the ones I've been talking about today, whether it's in luxury retail or, 
or restaurant groups, they, they offer similar opportunities. You can, a lot of what you will learn at Shah is applicable across other businesses. So keep your, keep your minds open to doing other, um, joining potentially other industries and other businesses, because when it comes to things like customer satisfaction and, and dealing with customers in, in, um, in a modern way, meaning, you know, understanding customer data, how to deal with customer data, how to use it uh, both in a personal way for customer contact, but also in a business way for, for maximizing the way that we, you know, we, we um, increase revenues, et cetera. It, it's not much different in luxury retail or in retail generally as it is in hotel rev management, you know, understanding what a customer wants and dealing with it smart in a smart way and in a personal way is still, you know, at the center of everything we do in hospitality. Uh, but it's the same in luxury retail. There are high touch points, um, you know, and, and so those skills are applicable. So I would just say, keep, keep your minds open to, to other opportunities that may be afforded at a time where, you know, jobs are going to be a bit tougher. But the longer term trends for our business remain good. And so I would say, keep learning. And, and anything you can do to add to your skill set, be creative, it, it, it will help. Thank you, Ian. Those are, uh, I hope everyone is listening and paying attention. So very wise words. And thank you for uh, calling out the fact that we are encouraging our students who don't yet want to enter the job market to enroll in our, um, in our master's program. So um, at this point, I know that many questions have been coming in. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Professor Leora Lance while I take a short break so that I can go and put my name on the list for the successor to not in less 5711. So. <laughs> yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lance, take it away. Thank you, Dean of Nature. Hi, Ian. Hi, Laura. And thank you because it's so fun to hear you and to hear from you, to learn more about you, of course and to hear your words of wisdom and advice. So thank you for this opportunity on Pleasure. behalf of everyone who's here. We did get a couple of questions coming in. Um, Peter Beda, I know you're there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share your first question. Peter is someone who's in our master's program, who's been in the industry for quite some time and is also part-time faculty with us. So it's a thrill to see Peter here. And he was wondering, Ian, if your love of travel and exploration and exploring, was that actually important to the roles that you have had? Was that a, an important impact in the positions that you took or the companies you worked with at all, including the one you're with now with Watches of Switzerland? It probably was actually, I never really thought of it that way, but yeah, implicitly it probably was, you know, I mean, at, at, at my core, I enjoy to, travel and see new places and you know particularly obviously in, in in Hilton that was you know it was actually a crucially important part of the job so I traveled to you know literally I, I we, we tried to count at one time but probably 100 countries you know over the years um and saw lots of places I wouldn't normally have seen uh, even if it was only for a day you know because the travel tended to be fairly truncated and punctual um, but, but that said, yeah, it probably was, you know, a, a, key, a key piece of this for me was at an early age, you know, I traveled outside of this little island called the UK and, and began to see what Spain and France and Belgium and Holland and all of these other countries were like and, you know, see the different cultures, eat the different food, etc. So from a very young age, I got to experience that fortunately and realized that there is a huge world out there. And, and you begin to appreciate the differences rather than you know, question the differences. So yeah, I probably was, it's a good question. I never really thought about it, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure deep down, that's probably a piece of what drove me. Excellent. And speaking of travel, have you traveled during this time when it's been challenging to travel or when you can travel and not for business necessarily, where do you want to go to next? What's, what's your next travel item? Yeah, I, well, first question I have, been traveling not not a huge amount you know right now i'm down in florida uh, but i go back up to dc um and to manhattan typically they're the two places i've been traveling most to for for you know uh, personal and business reasons um i haven't been at the it's funny the last time i was in overseas was almost exactly one year ago i was in the uk and I was talking to someone from the UK this morning and it kind of reminded me that I was over there 
uh, for business almost a year ago. So I haven't been back since. I, I mean, I'd, I can't wait to travel again. Is the first that you know is the, is the answer to the second question that you know it couldn't come soon enough for me. I was I was really hoping I was going to be in the UK the week after next because I have my first strategy session with the Watches of Switzerland board, and I wanted to be there in person for that. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen. So hopefully later in the summer. And, and frankly, although there are lots of places I do want to visit, um, you know, for, for fun reasons, I really need to go to the UK. I need to go, you know, go see the family and, and do some business things over there. So the first stop for me is going to be the UK, I think. That's understandable. That yeah. is completely understandable. I want to ask just one or two quick icebreaker type questions just to get to know you a little bit more. And for some of the students who I have uh, this semester who are on the line listening in, this is going to sound awfully familiar. Um, I don't know if you have the time, but have, are you reading anything right, right, now, right now? Is there a book that you just finished or that you're eager to read or that you're in the middle of? We'd love to know what, what inspires you. What are you reading? Well, um, it, it's funny. I mean, I mentioned Malcolm Gladwell, um, you know, Tipping Point, and I just, just recently read, reread actually, a World Without Us. I love Malcolm Gladwell's books. If anyone hasn't read them, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a Malcolm Gladwell promoter at this point. But we had Malcolm come to one of our conferences once as well. So I got the chance to speak with him offline type of thing. He came to one of our other conferences a couple of years ago. And I'd already read some of his books. But, you know, A World Without Us is, I just literally finished it probably two days ago, having read it before, maybe five years ago maybe less I don't know but it was it's a great all of his books are great and, I, and typically I'm more um, into non-fiction than fiction as am I and actually it's a, almost a year ago exactly that I had the chance to meet Simon Sinek similarly oh yeah in Boston actually and so I just finished again what's start with why um, so I understand I understand that kind of provocative inspirational yeah yeah wisdom so i can appreciate that do you have time to to binge anything on netflix or amazon prime i do yeah it's terrible i'm sure we all, we all do i guess but yes i do i've lit i do i tell you what, i can recommend um tons from netflix and prime unfortunately but i i'm probably kind of mainstream on this i love the ozarks that was great i thought that was a fantastic series bit, bit gritty but good and I most recently watched a series called The Sinner, um, which is three different, it's Bill Pullman, you know, who won some Emmys and it's quite provocative in terms of the way it makes you think about certain situations that people have been in, you know, and it's, it, it's a crime thing, but it's, it's, it's really good. Um, so I really enjoyed those. And then if you, if you happen to get Showtime, then I would definitely watch uh, Your Honor, if you like, um, that, that, that's, that's been great. That's excellent. It's good to know that you ha are making some time for this. We were, oh, yeah. because that was, and that's probably the last question I'm going to ask you before I turn it back over to Dean of Naja is that balance of family and, and work, of course, because work has really, it can be very consuming, especially in the roles that you're in. Mm. How have you found the ability to manage or what, how do you prioritize that balance? Yeah, it, look, it, it's interesting. We spent a lot of time thinking about this at Hilton in a corporate sense. We, we, we want because we wanted to try and see whether there's a way to really help our team members balance that, you know, in a way that made sense for them. And the first thing to say is it's different for every person. Right. You know, what, what I might consider to be, you know, a good balance. You might say, oh, my God, that's crazy. It's too much of this and not enough of that. So I think the way to look at it is. First of all, what, what makes sense for you and your personal situation? Can you adapt your work to, to work around that and the two can coexist comfortably so that it doesn't become a conflict? I think we never, we, inevitably we've all learned something new over the last year, right? About what that balance may or may not be. It probably re caused us to rethink what it may or may not be um, and probably will influence our thinking going forward. Um, and it's, I think it's not just, you know, the, the work-life balance, you know, the, the time that you spend outside of work. It's kind of what you do outside of work that matters as well. And that, again, is the way we looked at it, Hilton, was, you know, is we're not going to prescribe anything, but we're going we're gonna to suggest things that may be useful for you to consider, whether it's just literally downtime, rest, whether it's working, you know, 
to give back in communities that we we work, you know, charitable work, that kind of thing, whether it's sports, you know, and, and facilitating those things as we've done with, um, you know, in, in, in Hilton, at least, you know, with, with people being able to spend time at gyms and things like that, whatever it, whatever it may be. But in the end, I do think it's very personal. I mean, I think that there is no doubt a right balance for every person, you know, doing a 90% work and no social time is not good for anyone. But you, you've got to figure out for yourself um, how you can make that work. And then I think the, the successful companies recognize that it's not, we're not nine to five businesses anymore, you know. Whether, whether we want to be or not, it, it, it's kind of like there's too many other external determining factors now, not least of which is social media and social contact through electronic means. You know, that determines how people work. So I could be talking to you, you know, for an hour now and I've got 50 emails and I have to deal with them. So you, you can't determine everything, you know, in a, pre, in a prescribed way. But what I, I think successful companies recognize is that flexibility will win. And, and not having people feel the compel that their business day is nine to five. It might be nine to three on one day and then, you know, 10 to six the next day. It, it, as long as the work is done and people feel they're contributing successfully and the strategy is being executed on, you know, help make that balance work. Flexibility is something we've heard you say multiple times, actually, in this last hour. So I, I do hope everyone's noted that because that is so important for all of us to sort of get through tough times and, and balance our lives accordingly. Dean of Naja, if it's all right, I do have one last question that came in. I, and Ayushi, I hope I am um, sharing this properly, but Ian, we do have a student who wanted to ask, what do you recommend as the best way to keep up with the industry, to learn, to stay in touch with what's going on in the market? What, what suggestions do you have for our students to do that? Um, I mean, a few things. I mean, first of all, there's the formal routes, right? You know, and as, I mean, if you happen to be at, at, at school still, or even if you're not, you know, still being connected through the alum network, et cetera, you know, that, that's a very, very powerful tool. We have some great people in our alums as, as alums, and we have some great people on the board. Um, you know, some of my colleagues and friends on the board are, are really very giving of their time as well. So I think, you know, I personally don't mind receiving emails or, you know, you know, if I can help, I will. And I'm sure the other board members feel the same way as do the, the faculty. And then there's, you know, there's, there's the, the kind of the more mainstream ways of doing it, which is just reading, seeing, you know, reading whatever's available online, whether it's hospitality news, whatever the trade presses that you choose to follow, read and, and follow that. And, and I, you know, personally, even, you know, even now, but certainly when I was at Hilton, I, I check in on our competitors' websites. You know, I just understand what they're doing, right? You know, you get a, you get you get a good sense of direction and what might be strategically important and what a trend might be by just looking at what developments Hilton and others in the industry are undertaking, whether it's the move towards lifestyle or move towards you know re, um, you know growth in new countries, whatever it may be. You get a good sense of that by just tracking websites, basically of the big corporates. I hope any of the marketing students who are on the line heard that, follow the competitors. Um, thank you, Ian, very Pleasure. much. And no I'm gonna turn it back to Dean of Nature so that we can um, wrap this up and bring it to a close. Thank you so much for your time, Ian. Pleasure. Thank you, Leora. So in the minute that we have left, Ian, I'm just curious to know, um, uh, what roads you still have left to travel? What, what do you have in mind um, uh, for the future? Um, well, look, from a business perspective, uh, you know, I mentioned we're, we're just about to embark on our strategy session with the Watches of Switzerland group. And I, I feel really excited about hearing what the CEO and the team feel is, you know, the future next five years for a company. Um, and, and in reality, actually, you can apply that. That was always the most exciting time for me, frankly, in a, in a business year was to, to, to get down to the strategy session, because there you start to dream a little bit as well as, you know, think about what's realistic for us to, to, to achieve over five years. So I think for, for me, as relates to business, there's a few things, but one of which will be, you know, the shape of the Watches of Switzerland group for the next five years. I'm, 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 that, that's that's a, a, a big objective and goal for me. And there's lots of things that flow from that, um, you know, and the other businesses I'm involved in, including, 
you know, the, the work I'm doing with Blackstone as, as an advisor and sitting on the board of one of their companies and frankly, the work we're doing at Shah and shaping the future of, of the syllabus and the curriculum and, and those sorts of things. All of those form objectives in my mind, of, but being able to achieve some longer term goals for each of those entities or businesses. You know, on a personal level, I'm honestly, the, the next goal for me is to start traveling again. Uh, you know, that, that will enable so many other things to happen, but it will also be a mark that, that we're returning to some degree of normality. So, you know, uh, I have a very short term objective, which is to get back to the UK. And, um, you know, from that, then lots of things will flow. Oh, we are all longing to travel and, and get around. So thank you, Ian, so much for taking the time to meet with some of our, with our students, alumni, and our industry colleagues and faculty and staff, and for launching the Distinguished Speaker Series for 2021. I truly enjoyed talking to you. And it is always a delight to welcome you back um, to Shah. Um, right. And for everyone, um, I would welcome all of you to the next Dean's Distinguished Lecture on February 26th, when we speak one-on-one -on -one with Vera Minukian, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Senesta. And that company is shaking up the world of lodging. They've increased from 50 properties to over 1,200 in a matter of six or seven months. So is Senesta the new brand that will take its place in the leading lodging companies of the world. Find out what she has to say on February 26th, same time. Thank you and have a wonderful time. Thank you. Thanks, Arun. Thanks, everyone.